Uh, Chibu, thank you very much. I think that's an awesome way for us to begin. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to our seminar, uh, Spirits of the Trees, colon, uh, three spirits that you may or may not know how to pronounce. Um, we're going to walk through that right now to kick things off, <laughs> um, and we're going to be sticklers about pronunciation today just because we know this is the first time for a lot of you that you'll be encountering these products, and better to get it right the first time. So, Spirits of the Trees, Asaram, Arak, and Ogogoro. Say it with me a couple of times. Asaram, Arak, Ogogoro. Asaram, Arak, Ogogoro. Asaram, Arak, Ogogoro. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, my name is Brian Heffling. Uh, the O is silent um, while we're talking about pronunciation. Um, I will be your moderator today. Uh, I think of my job in this as being to ask questions rather than to give answers. The three people around me will be much better at giving answers, but uh, you're possibly wondering who I am, so I will talk a little bit about that to begin. Um, if you have heard of me before, it is probably in my capacity as an author. I've written a few books on spirits and cocktails, the uh, most recent of which is called The Cocktail Seminars. It was a Spirited Award finalist last year, uh, along with three other books that were much more impressive, but that was still very cool for me. Um, I also give uh, cocktail classes uh, up in Boston where I'm based. I used to work in distribution, and uh, I've got a business now where I help uh, independent distilleries who would like to either break into or grow their presence in the New England markets do that very thing. Um, I have no uh, direct professional stake in anything that is about to happen here today. <laughs> um, for the purposes of this seminar, I am honestly kind of just some guy. Um, but I have a very long-standing interest in spirits that are made from things uh, that I don't think of as the usual suspects, grapes, grains, sugarcane, agave, uh, as I suspect is going to be true for some of the other folks in this room today as well. Um, so I am, have been very, very happy to get the chance to work with uh, these fine people. Um, and put together this seminar and set of tastings for you. I also recognize that since you all probably want to taste these products, and the main thing standing in the way of that is me flapping my gums, um, I will try to keep this as brief as possible. But first, let's get some introductions uh, from our panelists. Uh, Joel, do you want to kick us off? Hello, everybody. Thank you. Is that on? No, it's better. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Joel Pelletier. I'm from Quebec. Uh, I'm the owner of uh, Distillery du Saint Laurent, um, and also the president of a very small union of producer of maple spirit. Thank you, Lola. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> this is loud. Um, my name is Lola Pedro. I'm hailing from Lagos, Nigeria, via London, and I'm the co-founder of Pedro's Ogogoro with Chibu Akukwe, who just did the libation. A pleasure to be in America, and a pleasure to meet you all. Hi, everybody. Let me uh, wish you in the traditional Sri Lankan fashion, which says, are you born, which means long life. After you leave here, you will have long life. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Devinda Balasurya. I am originally from Sri Lanka. That's where the Arak originates. My brand is Polarak. I live in Houston. I've been in the US for the last 10 years, and that's what prompted this product to fill in a, a much needed uh, niche. Thank you, and look forward to talking to you. And thank you, Brian. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna put up uh, a quick slide here. So I will, I will say at the outset, uh, anybody who would like a copy of the slide deck after the seminar, you're welcome to come and uh, let me know. We're happy to share it. Uh, we want to make sure that you have access to this information if you want it in the future, because that's frankly exactly what we want, is for people to want this information in the future, more of it whenever they can get it. Um, but this is a quick rundown uh, on what kinds of things we're going to be talking about today. So every spirit that is up here and all the spirits that are in your glasses and the cocktail is going to come out in a little while are made from the sap of some kind of trees. We have sugar maple, we have the oil palm and the raffia palm, we have the coconut palm, um, respectively for Asaram, which is made in Quebec, Canada, um, uh, Ogogoro, which is made in Nigeria, and Arak, which is made in Sri Lanka. Um, there's a few other details that are up there. Uh, we have some uh, interesting distinctions in terms of what kind of wood is being used, uh, some history about the individual brands, um, and uh, you know, whether it's made from, from fresh uh, sap or from a refined product. Uh, we will hear more about all of that in detail from each of the panelists in succession. Uh, each of them will get up and give some information about their products and their brands. And then we're going to have some roundtable discussion and some audience Q&A. So does that sound good? Awesome. 
All right. Uh, well, in that case, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Devin. Um, and I can advance slides for you if you want. Yeah. Yep. No problem. Uh, thank you, Brian. Now that we have been formally introduced, uh, let me kick off. Uh, Arak is the product. Paul Arak is the brand. Po the name Paul uh, is, refers to coconut in the local vernacular. That's the reason it's called Paul Arak. It is a truly one-of-a-kind spirit. If you taste it, you will understand what it is. Yes, where it came from, the originally the Greeks called the island Taprobane, the Arab traders called it, the Samoas called it Serendib, the Portuguese called it Selao, and the British coined Ceylon, it is now Sri Lanka. So it has a long history. This product too has a very long history. Uh, it, it, in, the first, in the 13th century, Marco Polo, he discovered this product. That is, actually, he discovered not the spirit, but the ingredient. And uh, James Tennant writing, I mean, it's all there, the, the, what happened, the historical part of uh, Iraq. Uh, it is a unique alcohol beverage made from the naturally fermenting sap of the coconut flour. What happens is the coconut flour, before it opens up, is like my arm. You slice it, you collect the juice. And the juice is, it can be drunk by itself. It's very refreshing. But if you drink it, it sits in your stomach and you drunk the whole day because it's fermenting there. So it is something that even, and when the, there is an interesting anecdote, what happens is when it's being collected in, uh, in usually earlier in clay pots, but now it's all plastic stuff, uh, animals get to it. And if animals get to it and you can see drunken animals running around, then you know what they've been up to, especially the monkeys. So the process is it's in a two-type distillation. In, uh, uh, it has the toddy or the sap has to be distilled within 24 hours. If it is not distilled within 24 hours, it turns into vinegar. That is another process. Mm -hmm. And it, there is a two-step distillation, and then it's matured in uh, tropical hardwood vats, maybe up to two to three years. And when the, actually when the spirit comes out, it's a clear spirit, like any spirit. And once you put it into hardwood vats, there is an impartation of color. And uh, to neutralize the color, you add a touch of caramel so that everybody, every bottle has the same color. But that's all there is. It's the spirit, water, and that's it. Uh, this, this is the only coconut spirit you'll find anywhere in the United States. Uh, it is new in the United States market. It's a pure coconut spirit. It's 100% pure coconut spirits. It's, once you taste it, you realize that it is something totally different uh, kind of spirits that you would have tasted. And uh, it is originally used by British seafarers as a substitute for their rum when they went, ventured far out into the east, when they couldn't find rum for their daily grog. Uh, this is what they used. And this was originally used as the original ingredient for the punch. You know what the punch is? Punch is actually derived from the Sanskrit word punch, which means five ingredients. And the fifth ingredient is the spirit. And Arak is the spirit that created the punch. Yes. Should we be sampling the uh, first? If you wish to sample the first Arak, it's number one. I must warn you, it's a 94 proof. If you'd like to put a little ice in it, it might be recommended, so please do not hold me liable if it burns you or you are set on fire. But you will, the thing that you will notice is that uh, the difference in taste as a spirit. Then uh, this can be consumed. It's a very versatile spirit. It can be consumed straight on the rocks. It can be, with, uh, if you don't want it sweet, either with club soda, ginger ale, cells of water, any still water or, uh, or sparkling water will go, to, uh, will mix well for it not to be sweet. Or with any kind of fruit juice or any 
um, alcoholic uh, uh, cocktail mix that you would like to do it as tomato juice, orange juice, fruit juice. It, it's a very versatile mix. Uh, I have four varieties in the market today. The VSOA is the standard one. It's unfortunately, it's not available in front of you. The double distill is also not available. The, the sweet coconut liqueur, that's number two. Uh, Old Reserve is the one you just drank. You can try the sweet coconut liqueur. I must tell you, it's a little sweet. If you would like to mix both together, you might get a better product with a higher kick. <laughs> For people who are here to taste alcohol, that's recommended. But taste it by itself, mix it together, and then some ice. But the coconut liqueur is 100% natural coconut. There are no artificial ingredients at all. It's a vanilla flavor that creates, gives an enhanced coconut taste. What's the spirit like? I'm sorry? What's the spirit? Is it the, it's the, uh, the coconut spirit. Because like I said, when the spirit comes out, it's uh, colorless. And that's, this is the spirit that is used to create the coconut liqueur. It, it is traditionally uh, aged in barrels. Otherwise, uh, it's a neutral spirit. And that's what the, the flavor compounds in the Arak are naturally formed. It's like about 0.3% flavor compounds. That's all there is. And that's the only uh, flavor that imparts as a spirit. Uh, there is a nice story about the 47 Old Reserve. That is the... Uh, one you drank first, that's a 94 proof. It was actually, the recipe was conceived, as you can see the history, it was conceived in the United States. In New York about 140 years ago, about two enterprising gentlemen who actually went to Ceylon then and created 200 bottles of the stuff and tried to sell it to the colonial masters over there. What happened was the formula was purchased by a company, United Kingdom, a British company called Gilby's, and Gilby's, uh, the current distiller, purchased the formula back from Gilby's. That's why it's such a unique story. And uh, that's like I said, uh, it is now owned by Old Reserve. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions, anything you need to know about Iraq, uh, about the SAP, or any, yes ma'am. I'm sorry? Um, how much sugar is in the sap? Uh, <laughs> I don't know because I haven't tested the sugar because there is actu actually the, the, there has to be some degree of sugar. Otherwise, it, the fermentation process doesn't ta uh, the, the, does not take place. But I, it has not been tested so far and I don't have that information. Yeah, you're welcome, ma'am. Uh, yes. Let me explain that to you. There are three types of Arak in the world. There's ARAK Arak that comes from the Middle East region. And essentially, that Arak, ARAK Arak, has to contain anise. The TTB, the uh, Tobacco uh, Board uh, of the FDA, uh, will not classify Arak as ARAK Arak if it does not have anise. I, it took me three years to, con con to convince them that this is, was a different Arak. So, right. <laughs> So the Arak Arak contains anise. Then there is another thing called Batavia Arak that was created by the Dutch when they colonized Indonesia. But that is basically a sugarcane-based rum. Sometimes they add some rice wine into it, but that's, uh, it's marketed as Van Oosten Batavia Arak. Right. You're welcome. That was easy. Anything else? <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have a longer Q&A. Okay. Let me hand it back to uh, Brian, and thank you very much for listening to Iraq. In uh, thank you, Devin. Uh, next, we have Joel from uh, Distillery de Saint Laurent. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, so happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Brian, for the invitation. Uh, Lola and Devinda, Marie, uh, excited to, to be part of that uh, seminar. 
Um, I'm really excited to present uh, Acerum, which is a new uh, spirit designation uh, and the first one for, uh, for a maple spirit. And uh, it's becoming the first uh, protected geographically uh, uh, indication uh, of spirit in Canada. So uh, when you imagine uh, Canada's landscape, uh, what do you see or what do you have in mind? Maple, yeah. Snow, yeah. Well, that's pretty much uh, what's on the flag, right? <laughs> yeah, a maple leaf uh, surrounded by snow. Well, that's about what Canada is, um, and also in Quebec. Um, and uh, well, Acerum uh, is—it's uh, pretty simple. It's made using the the, the one uh, only one iconic ingredient, uh, maple sap from uh, from Quebec, that we harvest after the long an harsh winter uh, in Canada. So when the snow melts and when the, the, the warmer days come at the end of the winter, that's when we harvest the, the maple snow and we make very nice uh, distinctive spirit with it. So what is Acerum? Acerum is a maple spirit obtained uh, exclusively by the distillation of uh, fermented maple sap from Quebec. Uh, so the, the name itself comes from the Latin name uh, Acer, which means maple, and acerum uh, is in Latin many maples. Uh, and it also, refer, um, it also refer to uh, the English word rum. Um, so it's the same kind of uh, technique and process that we uh, to produce rum, but instead of using uh, uh, cane sugar, we use maple syrup. So it, the, the acerum came from, uh, um, or it's an heritage from the First Nation. Uh, when the French, the first French and English uh, settlers uh, arrived in the northeast uh, regions of America, uh, they were not uh, really prepared for the long winters, and they were not, uh, the, they were, didn't, don't, uh, didn't have a lot of knowledge of the, the environment uh, and also the weather. And so uh, the, the supply of the, old, of the Europe, old world, were also uh, limited. Uh, so the, the First Nation, the Ojibwe, the Iroquois and Algonquins, they teach a lot of the settlers to uh, basically how to live and what to eat. Uh, and they also taught them to, uh, to collect the, the maple sap at the end of the long winters. So that tradition that the, the European settlers uh, learned from the, from the First Nation uh, evolved over time. So the distillation, uh, not distillation, but the harvest techniques and uh, also the, the maple production evolved over time. And now Quebec uh, produces more than 70% of all maple syrup uh, in the world. So it's a very, um, it's, it's, very, um, uh, it's a identity or a product in, in Quebec. It's very close to, uh, to our uh, culture and uh, history also. So how do we harvest the maple sap? Uh, so in the in the, at the end of the winter, in March and April, after a long and very cold and too long winter, um, there's a unique uh, phenomenon, natural phenomenon that happened. Um, we need cold days, uh, well, uh, cold nights and warm days to harvest the syrup. So what happened is when the, the, the nights get very cold, the maple, uh, the maple uh, is freezing and the sap goes up from the roots. And all the starch that is uh, in, the, in the roots goes up in a tree. And when the days uh, get, it get, get warm, uh, the maple sap is going down the tree and then we can harvest it. So people just dr uh, drill holes, small holes in the tree and they harvest the sap, which contain between two and 3% of sugar. So it's very, very low. And uh, after that, uh, we, um, we need to boil the sap into maple syrup. So uh, we need to evaporate all the, the water to concentrate the sugar to get a very thick and very flavorful uh, syrup that you might have uh, tasted in, in the past. And the, the, the bricks or uh, sugar percentage of the maple syrup is 65%. Uh, so it's very, very sweet, very aromatic also. So boiling is done uh, by evaporating the, the water. It used to be made uh, by uh, burning wood. Now we use more uh, ecological techniques uh, with uh, the, the, all the wind power and draw, uh, hydro power from, uh, from Quebec. 
Um, so it's a very uh, ecological product. Uh, the, the trees are not armed. Uh, the trees continue to grow for many, many decades since uh, the small holes, uh, after the small holes uh, uh, are, are made, the trees uh, uh, repair itself. All right. So now that we have the syrup, how we made the, the acerum itself? Well, it's very close to rum production. So we use maple, uh, not maple, but rum yeast to uh, ferment the maple uh, syrup into alcohol to distillation in our copper pot still. Then we aged the spirit in the oak barrels. Then we bottle it. So there's only three ingredients. It's 100% maple syrup, water, and yeast. Nothing else is added, no sugar, no sweetener, no coloring, no uh, aromatic substance. So uh, I'm, if you want to taste the product itself, it's the third, uh, third product. And what you have in your glass is a five years old acerum, and it's been, it's been finished in a pear uh, brandy cask. And why pear brandy? Because there's, um, uh, there's a, a, a flavor compound that's called uh, isoamyl acetate, uh, that, that we found naturally in acerum, and it's about six times higher than in other spirits. So, uh, and in that flavor compounds is, uh, it, it tastes like pear. So why, um, why distilling maple syrup? Well, uh, to discover the hidden aromas of maple, because people, when you think about maple, usually you think about sweetness and you think, think about pancakes. And uh, we wanted to find all those subtle and delicate aromas behind that sweetness. So that, that is why we, uh, we, we, we produce acerum. And the best way to uh, discover those delicate aromas, well, is to distill them. So what does acerum taste? Uh, it's very close to um, fruit uh, brandies, so maybe uh, pears brandy or um, uh, apple brandies because of the isoamyl acetate. Also, you'll find the butterscotch and caramel notes of maple sugar because of the uh, Maya reaction that occurs in the, the boiling uh, of the maple syrup. Uh, when you boil the maple syrups, it caramelized the sugars, so you have like caramel notes also. Um, there's a slightly mineral and bitter bitterness taste. Uh, that's because it comes from a, a, a tree, uh, so it, it tastes a little bit like the bark of the tree. And I just have a few sips of Devinda's uh, 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 Paul Arak. And I can find also that, that notes of uh, like bitterness. You can, uh, and also Ogogoro uh, I taste earlier. So I already find some similarities with other uh, uh, tree sap spirits. And also there's a buttery and oily textures. Uh, pairings and cocktails. Well, uh, any pairings with apple or, or pear juice is really good. Um, I think that there's a, a Cocktail that will come uh, uh, maybe uh, later. Yeah, I mean, it'll come, it'll come. It will come maybe later, but you will you will taste uh, acerum cocktail with paired with uh, apple juice, uh, cinnamon, uh, ginger, sesame. It's also really good. Uh, any cocktail made with citruses, uh, like classic rum cocktails, daiquiris, etc., or an old-fashioned variation, and it's a great uh, dessert companion also. So it's a, a new IGP, it's, it will be the first one in Canada for a spirit. And uh, we started, we were only three producers, now we are about a dozen in Quebec. So uh, I think it's, it's, will be a, uh, it's really exciting to be part of that movement, to explore a new raw material. Uh, it's really the dream for any distillers to explore new, new raw material. And as a bar manager and, and also a cocktail maker, it, I think it's also really cool to explore new things, new flavors. And uh, yeah, so I invite you to, uh, to share the, the, the sugar shack tradition. So uh, after many months being inside our houses, freezing outside, um, there's a tradition in March and April in Quebec that we gather with friends and family to enjoy a very high uh, caloric meal and um, uh, having a few drinks. So that's the sugar shack tradition. And also, of course, eat a maple syrup. Um, 
so that's uh, that's the celebration that I invite you uh, drinking Acerum. It's uh, and, and also it's becoming uh, it's it's uh, becoming a, a tradition slowly in Quebec. So I invite you to share that tradition with me. So uh, merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, attention. And uh, I think that we will have a Q and A after uh, after the Lola's presentation. So I'm going to let Lola explain uh, you uh, Agor Ogogoro. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, if I was drinking any more, I'm not sure I'd be able to deliver this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Good? I'm happy to be in America after some time. Um, thank you so much, Brian, for inviting us. Um, and as I said, I'm from Nigeria. I came from Lagos, Nigeria, but via London. That's where I was born and bred. And we're here today to talk about Oguguru. So in the 10 minutes we have, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into Africa, just to see what you guys know about the continent. But we'll start on drinks because I know you're all spirit and alcohol aficionados and enthusiasts. So a question for you guys. Can somebody name me just three indigenous African spirits. All right, you're not rushing to raise your hands, are you? Um, uh, any indigenous African alcohol at all? Palm wine. Palm wine, all right, we got one. Anything else? <laughs> Which one? Okay. Um, one from North Nigeria. Yeah, Burukutu, that? Yeah? Okay, yes, yes, yes. And then I heard someone say something over there. Fantastic. Well, actually, there are many sorghums. There's one called Changa in Kenya. But actually, what is quite shocking is that for the world's second largest continent, we don't really know that much about the alcohol coming from there. And actually, today, we want to talk about just one of them, and that is Oguguru. So I'm going to pretend that I'm speaking to an African audience because normally when I am, I ask them, what is Oguguru? And the first answer people give is African gin. Now, Oguguru is called Akpeteshi in Ghana, Sodabi in Togo, and even the Changa I mentioned from Kenya. We distill all kinds of interesting spirits that are indigenous across Western Central Africa. But for some reason, we always call it a local gin. So the first lesson I usually teach you all, and this creates a lot of uproar, by the way, is that Ogogoro is not gin. Because all the way to the top of our food and beverage regulatory bodies, any indigenous spirit must be classified as a gin. So that was a massive journey for us, because we, of course, know, especially with the Londoner and me, that gin comes from juniper berry. So I knew I wasn't drinking gin. And actually, what we are drinking is a palm spirit. In our case, it's from the oil or raffia palm tree, and for Pedro specifically, it's from the raffia palm tree. So very similar to the Arak. Actually, we're kind of botanical siblings. That is where it's from. But when you say palm, I know in the West, the moment we step out of Africa, alarm bells start ringing. The controversy around palm usually shuts us down from any level of storytelling. But actually, in an African context, we are subsistence farmers, and the tree itself is sacred. It's the tree of life. We use every single part of the tree. We use it for our food to make soups. We use the bark and the wood for furniture. And we even use the raffia for mats, for baskets, and things like that. But actually, the most exciting thing from the palm tree is the reason we're here today is the sap. It's the palm wine. Now, if anyone tells you you can drink palm wine in America, tell them to piss off. <laughs> because palm wine, exactly as uh, um, we heard from Iraq, really comes naturally from the tree. You create an incision in the tree, and immediately the sap comes out. It is immediately fermenting with wild yeast. And even in Lagos, if you're not close enough to the bush, you have people in buses going down to Lagos and palm wine exploding because they've tried to bottle it. So you really have to be on site 
to enjoy proper palm wine. Um, what they do after creating an incision in the tree, this sap is collected and left to ferment till it's about the strength of a beer. And then literally on site again, you use a bit of firewood and you cook that palm wine, basically moonshine distilling. And what you get is a kind of 35 to 55% ABV distillate. It's pretty rough. It's the way I like to drink it. But that's not what we're talking about today. Now, let's go back to palm wine. This is the cherished child of drinking in Africa. It is sweet, sour, has a very kombucha kind of flavor profile, fermented. Families love it across the continent. And palm wine is the raw material for ogogoro. But ogogoro is a very dirty word. It is the bastard child of the family. It is the drink that everyone is scared of and is very ostracized. And you rarely see people in affluent parts of the city, especially in Lagos, where I'm from, enjoying ogogoro. It's something to be ashamed of. But the question for us was, why? And then we realized there was a historical legacy, a colonial legacy attached to the reason people don't drink ogogoro. And actually, that was because when the British came not only to Nigeria, but Western Central Africa, they had to, of course, trade London dry gin for uh, resources. So the first thing they did was to criminalize um, the indigenous spirits. And then from there, even today, you still see people calling it an illicit gin, a local gin, because that is the way it was termed. And up until today, if you go out in Lagos or wherever, Accra, you'll see people taking a sense of pride from drinking imported spirits and also the same kind of distance from indigenous spirits. But unfortunately for Ogogoro, there was another problem because today it's a catch-all phrasing for cheap synthetic shit, you know, stuff with uh, all kinds of aromas, additives, and things like that. And actually, you see the mamas on the street selling this in sachets and really cheap plastic bottles for the lowest classes of society to get a quick, cheap high. So this is how Ogogoro is renowned today, unfortunately. But behind all of this, there's a deep cultural significance. Because before the colonials came, before the 1800s, actually, the chiefs, the elders, the kings would use Ogogoro for traditional cultural ceremonies. And even up until today, even I know when Chibu got married, he had to present Ogogoro as his dowry for his wife. So even until today, as you saw with the libation that he delivered, it has a very deep resonating cultural uh, significance. You can see here, this is one of the kings from the communities that we source from. So after kind of understanding all of this, as a team, we decided to set ourselves on a mission. How do we define, redefine, repackage, and refine Ogogoro in a way Nigerians and Africans have never seen before? We came up with Pedro's, which is 100% organic palm spirit. It's 40% ABV, that's our bottling strength, but I personally drink at 60. And uh, it's half a litre. And again, if we switch that to dollars, it's about $50. But what's important to us is that we micro distill it in small batches and we handcraft it in Nigeria. We are Africa's first to do that. So we were going to have the libation here, but Brian was so kind to allow us to have it at the beginning of the session, which was so befitting. But we will use this opportunity, since Chibu has done us the honors, to taste the Pedro's. I think it's number four. four. So, before we taste it, I'd like us to nose it, and I'd like you to shout out what you perceive on the nose. Butterscotch, spot on. Anything else? Vanilla, yes, lots of vanillinoids. Anything else? Creaminess, yes, absolutely. And I'm going to take the liberty for us to actually taste it in the traditional African way, so do watch me. All right, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> Packs quite a punch when you drink it that way. 
So what are we getting in terms of flavor profiles here? Absolutely. Yep, buttery, creamy. Yep, sorry? I heard something over there. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, it's 40%. Yes, yeah, citrus notes. Brian, anything? Sorry? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, absolutely. So every year we get a new harvest and different profiles present themselves. We do not homogenize. We take pride in that. And, but usually we find uh, three types of profiles presenting themselves. One is this kind of butterscotchy, coconutty sweetness. Another which is not so presenting itself with this particular batch, which is a citrusy, think of key lime notes. And the third thing, which I didn't really hear um, from this group, is a slight spice. Think of black peppercorn. Did anyone get some spicy notes? Yeah? OK, fantastic. So um, after five years as an organization, we were really kind of spearheading a level of cultural significance. Uh, we went from people saying over their dead body would they serve or go grow in their fancy bars to people you know, rushing for the drink and us being unable to meet demand. You know, we're now in quite a few African countries and we keep kind of pushing it forward, but what's important for us is that we set the rules of the game. And so these were some of the rules that we came up with. Um, we basically work with local communities. We do not reinvent the supply chain. So the people that are the palm wine tappers, we are revitalizing the industry. And most of them that work for us now primarily are women because they just do the job better. Sorry, guys. Um, but also they, uh, we tap only wild trees, not plantations, and they must be aged at the end of their lives. And of course, only in the Hamatan season, which represents the driest season, which gives you the highest quality sap. So these are some of the women that we work with currently. You see there, like this woman, this mama is mega old, and she just has this magical hand where her batch is always far nicer. And actually, we never get to bottle it because we end up drinking it by the time we get back to Lagos. <laughs> but it's fantastic. Oops, sorry. So yeah, you can see it's a lot of hard work. We use every part of the tree in the distillation process because, as I said, the tree itself is sacred. And even in its death, there's some larvae that feast on the remains of the moldy palm tree, which then becomes a delicacy that we enjoy with the spirit. And once we get it out of the bush, working with these communities, we bring it down to our micro distillery in Lagos, um, we basically try to follow artisanal processes. Anyone that's been to Nigeria knows we don't have 24-hour electricity, so we try to run a full distillation process that does not use electricity. Um, we also take it through fractional distillation, have a very slow maturation, uh, 90 days dilution, and of course, like my colleagues here, we do not add any additives, colors, or flavorings. So that's Chivu. Uh, he's the face of the company. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do now is, Chibu, I'm going to ask him to come up and read the manifesto. And then I'll just kind of scroll you through some pictures, because I think my time is up. And when he finishes, we can take number five. I would strongly advise that you have a nice block in it, because this is a hibiscus cocktail, which is one of the most popular or go grow cocktails in Nigeria. So if we can get some ice, that'd be amazing. And then after Chibu reads the manifesto, we can say cheers and have a drink. Thank you. I am not illegal, illicit, nor local brew. I am not gin. I am not vodka, whiskey, nor brandy. I am not inferior, counterfeit, nor unnatural. I am not there. I am a Pateshi, Kai Kai, and Sapele Wata. I am a Guguru. I am heritage, culture, and tradition. I am authentic, organic, and the finest. I am yours. Your machete, fire, and drum. Your water, tree, and people. Your provenance, future, and Africa. Your pride, power, and spirit. I am ours. Thank you very much. Um, 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. So I'm going to have a sip of this. That's phenomenal. Um, uh, you may also be wondering about the cocktail that was handed out a moment ago. <laughs> that is uh, our Asram cocktail. The timing snafu was entirely my fault. Um, but you should please feel free to enjoy that. Uh, and uh, Joel, do you want to say anything about the, the Asram palm that they've got in front of them? Uh, yeah, the cocktail is uh, three years old Asram. Uh, apple juice. It brings uh, a little bit of sweetness and also uh, acidity to the cocktail. Uh, a little bit of maple syrup and uh, bitters. And that's it. And uh, the hibiscus cocktail is really, really nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very cool. So uh, I would like to uh, now put some questions to our panel. Um, but since we have some time, uh, I, I would start by, if anyone has a sort of burning question about one of the spirits in particular they would like to ask, now is a great moment to do that while we're all enjoying some cocktails. Yes, sir. Uh, to Joel on the Astrum, much like there is brandy and then cognac, well, Astrum is the exclusive brandy that is the IPG in Quebec. Uh, yes. So, I mean, uh, any, any distillers can produce uh, maple spirit. Uh, but we decided as a group of distiller to, to uh, reserve the name Acerum to uh, maple spirit produced in Quebec using only Quebec maple sap. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, so we start, uh, I mean... Acerum, you can produce acerum using even maple sap if you want. So you, can, you could ferment maple sap, but it's so low in sugar that it will not be very efficient. Uh, some producers uh, use what we call um, uh, osmose uh, uh, filtration to, to uh, increase the, the bricks uh, number to about uh, 15 bricks. But most producers use maple syrup. Uh, and then they dilute the maple syrup with uh, water before fermentation. So uh, we, we bring the, um, the bricks uh, about 35 to 40 bricks and then ferment into a maple wine. After that, uh, double distillation in a copper pot still. Um, and uh, the, the final distillate is between 65 and 70 percent alcohol. And, uh, we barrel that distilled at at, uh, at uh, uh, still proof, and after distillation, dilution. So what you had um, number three, the the five years old uh, finished in the pear brandy uh, cask. This one is at forty seven percent alcohol. And a question there. Thank you. As I said, we only had 10 minutes, so <laughs> <laughs> to tell you about Africa. Um, <laughs> so um, actually, when we were thinking about, can I have the bottle, please? When we were thinking about the design of the bottle, this is the first time it's ever been bottled. It was quite important for us to really pay homage to the people across the River Rhine region, not just in Nigeria, but as I said, Western Central Africa that make this drink. So you can see in terms of the colorways, you have a kind of navy blue and white nautical uh, palette. But then actually, and of course the copper represents a distillation, which really we're celebrating the underdog. Everyone loves palm wine, but we're the Ogogoro guys. So um, when we actually started to think about the crest, we call this the Pedro's crest, we, re we went digging across West Africa, and we realized that our traditional languages are actually symbolic languages. So in my tribe, I'm Yoruba, we have a language called Adire, and we basically communicate on cloth, on fabric, and these are symbols as concepts. Chibu is from the Igbo tribe, and he has a symbolic language called Uli, which is really fast dying out. 
and you see women uh, carving these beautiful symbols on their bodies before they get married um, to communicate a level of preciousness. Um, again, there's another language in Nigeria alone called insibidi, which again is symbols that are put all over old houses and really communicate in very deep traditional concepts. Uh, Ghana, I drink and so on and so forth. So what we decided to do was to take, to think up what the six key elements of Ogogro is. And we found water, uh, the riverine people, distillation, the palm tree, this sacred source, the drum, this is the vessel which we really caught us off guard. And actually our bottle is a scaled down dimension of the drum. Mm -hmm. The fire, of course, it's cooking the palm sap. Uh, the machete, I'm a Londoner by birth. When I got to Nigeria, I went to the bush for the first time, all the animals, the reeds, the creatures. I, was, I didn't have the right tools. So I realized the importance of having the tools. Now you come to my house, I've got at least 10 machetes. <laughs> and then of course, last but not least, is the people. It's all about community. From you guys here today, actually having the curiosity to be here, all the way back to the palm wine tapper, who we just sent a random picture to of us in America. And he's like, what the heck is going on? They're drinking Ogogoro in America. So we took these together. We actually started with about 16 different versions of images from absolutely figurative into symbolic language, looking at all these different languages, and um, basically came down to the most simplified line drawings of each of these elements. And then we put them together, if you go to the last slide, to make the Pedro's crest. Thank you. I, I love that. I think that's really cool. Um, uh, we'll do a little more audience Q&A. All right, I'll take one more question. <laughs> Great question. Let's start with Devin, then go down the line. I, I really didn't understand the question. <laughs> uh, how, if at all, is your uh, coconut sap process before it comes to you? The coconut, uh, it comes here as a spirit. Okay. The coconut sap is processed in-house, in, in, in the country of origin. It is a traditional, it's been going on for hundreds, maybe a thousand years. It's, I mean, Sri Lanka is an island. It's an island of coconuts. <laughs> if you go over it, all you see is coconuts. <laughs> and they are floating all over the ocean. So, the sap has been collected and drunk by itself and processed into distillates. So, I, I, I really don't know where I should be directing my question, but... Uh, are you asking me the origin of the sap or so the... I, I, think, I think the distinction here is that, that Devin is an importer of a spirit that is contract produced by two of the main uh, Iraq distilleries in Sri Lanka. The, whereas, the, the, yeah, the, let me yeah. clarify this. The distillate processing uh, the distilleries in Sri Lanka are quite developed. There are maybe 30, 40 distil distilleries over there. Uh, and they are huge distilleries. They can supply the whole of the United States if... United States want to drink Arak. So, that, so, so it's just not a cottage We're industry, that if happens. that's what you are referring to. It is a proper industry where people drink all the time, and per capita consumption of Arak in Sri Lanka is higher than Chicago, just to let you know, that's, <laughs> put it into perspective. <laughs> I, like, I like that point of comparison. Um, but so Lola uh, and Joel, do you want to weigh in on the, the question of how processed is your, your base ingredient before you yeah. get to it? So can I get the pointer thing again? The, so yes. The there you pictures. go. OK, so um, actually, we take pride in controlling the process from the tree to the bottle. Um, I'm just going to see if I can find one or two pictures. Um, when we first started, we thought we could just drink our way across Nigeria and find uh, the nicest Ogoguru and basically bottle it. That was the original plan. Um, when we first started exploring, this is a traditional distillery. This is what they look like at the very best, right? And you can see they're using the drums, the blue drums and stuff. So we started supplying. Um, 
You can see these drums are the same drums that transport oil. I don't know if you know about the pirates in the uh, southern regions of Nigeria. So it's really another kind of wealth um, where, as I say, because of the traditional uses of Ogogoro, people still need access to it. So they're actually transporting Ogogoro in these barrels, tons of these ships every day across the country for people that need to do dowries, do ceremonies and prayers and stuff. So when we first started exploring, um, we went to the drum market and we decided to get our own drums. And we kind of looked around and everything was a little bit tatty because we were trying to celebrate African excellence. And we we're not trying to really put the local drinkers out of business, we were trying to really put Hennessy out of business. Sorry, <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> So we actually was able to find a yard. I'm not going to tell the full story. And we had to, yeah, I know. We had to um, get our own equipment and import it into the country for the first time. We only have a handful of distilleries in Nigeria, and none of them distill. So everybody is importing alcohol. So we did, you know, this is our first time. You can see I'm actually wearing the same dress. <laughs> I noticed that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we uh, went to a place called Sapele, which is really the cognac region. I think someone asked a question in regards to uh, the Aserum. Um, and everyone talks about Sapele water, which is really uh, the area you go, the, the kind of appellation of origin where you get the best stuff, like the biggest kings, they all supply from here. And that's where we started supplying. But unfortunately, because we weren't kings or elders, we started getting some really dodgy drums, drums that were actually sadly adulterated with things like battery acid and diluted with all kinds of crap. And we realized quite quickly, to go back to your question, that we couldn't rely on this process. So that's when we had to go back to the village and actually start to understand the process of tapping the tree, terroir, the right time of the year, how old is the tree, the different communities. And I made that quick joke about women, but actually we found a very small village where women were distilling and we'd never seen it in our lives. And when we saw these women distilling, they were making in such small batches. Can you see their equipment here? These are like tree trunks that are carved out and stuff like that. And actually they say in these villages, only women are allowed to cook the palm wine because they cook it in a way like they're cooking it for their families. And these women use Ogogoro as medicine, because of course alcohol really transport medicinal properties very quickly into the system than water. So what you see in these villages is every morning, like the way we might have a coffee, they will cook a little pot of Ogogoro, and then they will put some leaves and bark into it with different medicinal properties, and they will bath even their children in this liquid. And when you ask them, why are you bathing a baby with Ogogoro? They said, well, obviously it's a baby. They can't drink it. But it will go, the medicinal properties will be absorbed through the pores of the skin. And this blew our minds. So after this point, we started working very specifically with this village. And we went down from our big blue drums to our little kegs. What meant more trips, <laughs> more specificity, uh, less Smaller batches, of course, but a much, much higher quality product. And now today, even though it's a little bit more tedious, we take pride in this part of the process. Um, that's, Sorry, take it back. No, yeah. that's very cool. Uh, Joel, do you want to weigh in on the, uh, the base ingredients you're getting? And what site they're in? Yeah, so we, uh, we use maple syrup from, uh, produced by a local uh, producer, maple syrup or harvester. Uh, it's located about... Uh, 10 miles or 20 kilometers uh, from, the, from our distillery. So we get the, the, the maple syrup directly from uh, La Montagne Blanche or White Mountain uh, maple uh, producer. Uh, there's uh, thousands of maple producers in Quebec, so that uh, we can choose uh, many, many. And in our region, Bassin Laurent region, where we're located, there's many, many of them. For, so for, for us, it's not a problem. Um, thank you. And uh, well, I think you spoke to <laughs> you spoke to this a little bit already in some of the, the products that you were getting and things they were yeah, adulterated with. Yeah, it's dodgy. And actually, going back to your last question about fail-safes, what's been nice with working with these specific communities is that they're really 
ready to kind of experiment and to really try different things. You know, we had to bring in some master distillers from outside of the continent to really figure out how we get it to a level that we were happy with. And these women were like, oh shit, we're over fermenting. How do we, you know, in Nigerian culture, it is celebrated depending on how many flies land on your palm wine. That is a sign of great palm wine. But of course, it's shitting a lot of stuff into the palm wine. You get a very vinegary spirit, so we don't want that. <laughs> and when you try and do that in places like Sapele, you get no good results. But with these women, we were able to introduce, for example, very simple cheesecloth that they put over the mouth of the keg, and immediately our yield doubled. So it's been really, really <laughs> useful for us, not just from a upskilling the community perspective, but also the quality of the spirit that we're getting from the bush. So I do want to put a couple of general questions to the panel, and then we'll come back and take a few more from the audience. Um, but uh, the first one is, you know, you're, you're all up here now. You've heard each other's stories. You've tasted each other's products. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we brought you here because you're all making spirits from tree sap, which is a whole kind of sugar that, like, we don't usually talk about when we're talking about distilled spirits. You don't have tree sap sections in liquor stores or on spirits lists at bars, right? Um, so having, you know, had this much contact with each other, do you feel a sense that there, that there are common experiences between you, that there's a certain kinship between the products that you are making? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Yes. Let, let, me, uh, let me answer that question. Like I said before, it took me three years to convince the TTB that coconut arak is a specialty product, a specialty spirit. And in, if you go into any of the liquor stores, you might find uh, uh, Asian spirits, you might find bourbon, the whole regular stuff, but you will never find a specialty spirit aisle. So that mm. probably answers the question. Um, and I suppose a related question, since I think we have an audience today that is biased in favor of being interested in spirits made from the sap of trees. Um, uh, you know, who, uh, if anybody, who else could have been up here that, that y'all know of? Like, I know this, this is not the largest category in the world. Uh, the one class of spirit of this type that I'm aware of, there's also a coconut palm distillate that's made in the Philippines I'm aware of. Um, and did I just hear another one? Yeah, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, yeah. okay. Um, so if there's, and the audience may be very knowledgeable on the subject as well, but I think that's, a, that's another good thing. Clearly we've got people who are interested in this stuff. If there's you know, other traditions we should be up here celebrating, like who else comes to mind if you've got them? Mastija, yes. Ah. Which is, uh, it, it's an infusion, right? Rather than a distillate of the sap. Well, they take the sap. They t but they do use the sap, right? I mean, it's, 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 very, it's, it's in the same general family, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Mastija from Greece. Mm -hmm. Greece, the country. And Greece, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, so, I I notice also, um, you know, when when we come to an event like Tales of the Cocktail, uh, one of the, I think, common trajectories from new knowledge uh, is, well, how do I use that myself, mm. right? Um, I don't know if there are distillers in the room who are now thinking about getting into the sap spirits business. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> um, I, I'm curious, uh, you know, what, what y'all would say to people who have heard this and thought, I want to do that. Uh, if, if somebody would like to get into the business of producing another sap spirit themselves, and I can actually ask a more specific question if it's a helpful point of jumping off, because uh, all three of you are coming from traditions that are very grounded in the foodways of your respective regions. Either the spirits themselves are highly traditional or the ingredient is highly traditional in the area. Um, you know, if we had somebody who is a distiller in California who says, you know, we've got uh, trees that, you know, were uh, imported to this region a couple of hundred years ago, and we've, we just want to mess around and see what kind of thing we can make from the sap that runs through it. You know, does that, um, does, is that something that interests you? Does that feel like we're growing the category, we're, we're, you know, expanding the people who are interested in this kind of thing? Or does that feel almost like you're skipping some of the important steps? Actually, anything different. If, if everybody in the spirits world or in the in the in, in in the alcoholic beverage industry is always looking for something different. I don't know what kind of tree uh, Brian has in mind that I, you can. I didn't have a specific tree from. in mind. That was just but, a hypothetical. <laughs> but if, if there is a tree that the sap can be extracted 
and a distillate produced, I'm sure that's going to be workable. Because the, the consumer is always looking for something different. Mm -hmm. I have found that in my practical approaches and selling the product one-on-one uh, -on -one directly to the consumer. They always look for something different. Does that uh, answer that question? Uh, there, there's always been historically a strong link between alcohol production and the the, the agriculture or or the the, the available sugar uh, mm. in the territory. So, uh, I mean, in Sri Lanka and in Nigeria and in Quebec, the, the most available source of sugar are often those those trees. Mm -hmm. So maybe in other territories, um, where, 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 where some, some tree, uh, tree sap uh, uh, might, might be converted into alcohol, I, I can maybe see a potential exploration there. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, again, it was a sort of hypothetical question. But Brian, <laughs> Brian, just to elaborate, uh, so although Sri Lanka has an abundance of coconut, there are other palms. There is the Kitul palm, there is the Palmyra palm, and all of, all of those palm trees, the sap is uh, distilled into producing some form of arak. So any palm juice, uh, the sap of uh, uh, the palm tree can, because it's a naturally fermenting liquid, can be utilized to distill and produce a, a distillate, which is a spirits. Well, and, and we may have uh, glossed over this a little bit, but so my impression is that, first of all, you have palm trees of many kinds in many places all over the world, and that in most places where you find palms, you find palm wine. Is that a fair characterization? <laughs> Absolutely. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, something for us all to keep in mind, I think, the next time we're someplace with palms, which, oh, gosh, I think we're in one right now. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> um, all right, let me put one other question to the panel, which is, so you, you, you're all representing products that, uh, you know, have, have a bit of, I think, an uphill battle in terms of name recognition um, uh, in, in many markets. But uh, sometimes that's a disadvantage. People, you know, are not interest, are more interested in sticking with stuff that, that, that is sort of proved, that they know the category, they know what they're getting into. And sometimes, Devin, as you were saying, especially direct-to-consumer, people are very interested in the novelty. So uh, I, I think the question I would, I would put to you is, you know, where do you find each of those uh, outweighing the other one? Under what circumstances is, you know, it, is it a harder fight because people are unfamiliar versus sort of a, a, a you know, um, a novelty that is appealing to the people you're trying to sell to? <clears throat> sure. This is, that, this is a real, purely business decision because the marketing costs have to be uh, compared or uh, weighed against the, the product costs and uh, eventually it's a business decision because uh, product awareness, because people don't know. I mean, how many of you knew about um, Arak? Go grow or SRM today? <laughs> Just a few, not everybody. And you're here because you knew about it. But how many empty chairs I see over here? So they did not know. So people don't know this is the big issue here. Mm -hmm. And to create awareness is a very costly exercise. I don't know how many of you are in business field right now, but marketing costs are phenomenal. And then if, if you add the marketing cost to the product cost, then your product is beyond the reach of the normal consumer. Exactly. I'm trying, I have given my prices in my presentation as a regular price and most of my uh, spirits are priced at about 24, 22, between 20 and 25, except for the premium which goes to 35 dollars I'm talking about, not uh, any other currency, but uh, that's a retail price. So. It's a cost issue, as I see it. I don't know how the other two would like to comment on that. I, I, I agree. Uh, it's, uh, those are niche products. Mm -hmm. um, uh, e even in, uh, in Quebec, people don't really drink Aceram uh, compared to Ogoboro or, or Arak, where I think there's already a tradition, a strong tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, even in our country, there's no tradition. People consume maple syrup on itself and on pancakes and they're really uh, uh, found of that product but not 
in the form of spirit. Mm -hmm. So we need to build uh, the awareness of our brand, Saint Laurent, but also the awareness of the spirit Acerum itself. So we produce, actually our distillery mainly produce whiskey and, and gin. And to support, those are the, the, the thing that support the Acerum production, which is uh, just a, a hard project. <laughs> so for now, for us, it more like, it's, it's more like a let's do this, uh, let's do it uh, project than more <laughs> like a, a business, business on, on itself. Yeah. You've got to start somewhere, right? Huh? You've got to start somewhere, right? Well, it's like uh, we're starting a new uh, designation. So we're, we're like uh, on the year zero of cognac or mezcal or, or scotch whiskey. It's the year zero of Acero. We need to start somewhere, right? I love that characterization. <laughs> Um, Ola, do you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, maybe just a little bit. I think uh, from an African perspective, um, as uh, it's been said, it is very, very well known, but Ogogoro really is a dirty word, or well, it was a dirty word. And, you know, as I said, it was, it'd been quite a journey for us because this was really a passion project for the team. However, today now, um, if you do find yourselves in Lagos, you're more than welcome to come. Um, you will see that actually, because there is that traditional connection to the product, our only work is to convince people that it will not kill you on taste, <laughs> right? So we use some devices, like putting it in a proper bottle, because before this, you only had to buy it in kegs or empty water bottles. Um, you know, we try to tell a nice story, but uh, actually the marketing thing is a real thing. However, as I say, Lagos is the most popular city in Africa. And frankly speaking, if you go to some of the finest cocktail bars, you have actually a deep connection with the mixologists with this product. Because for the first time in their professional careers, they are actually making drinks with Ogoguru instead of cognacs or whiskeys or whatever from other places. Now, fortunately for us, or maybe unfortunately, the dilemma is that it's not known uh, all over the world. However, fortunately for us, there is this openness now to the final frontier that is Africa. I landed in America about two days ago. Immediately, I heard Burner Boy on the radio. And I was like, shit, Nigerian music, OK. <laughs> um, you know, and again, we passed through Atlanta, which felt very Nigerian to me. And somehow, it's not as alien as it probably was 10 years ago. So when you have, you know, we went from, again, tequila to mezcal to sotol to all these more and more niche products, I think this is the time, actually, and I'm actually very optimistic about the future. Uh, that's, that's a phenomenal... Yeah. 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 You're here. Um, that, that's a wonderful note to end on. We're not actually quite done, though. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I want to uh, pose maybe one more question to the panel, and then if we've got a couple more from the audience, I'll take them. Um, so uh, we've, we've, we've got you know, a well-framed, I think, marketing problem here, uh, and I think that's totally fair. Um, one, um, one thing that may be helpful, uh, that I think would be helpful, if we want sort of a rising tide that's going to lift all the boats we've got up here on this stage, is to kind of standardize the terms that we're using. I know I've, I've used the phrase sap spirits, tree spirits, spirits, tree sap spirits, spirits made from the sap of trees and various things. Since the time, in the time that we've been up here, um, if we might be able to come to a single specific term that we can agree on for the future, uh, those are all perfectly valid options. I'm gonna throw out one more possibility, which is I framed this problem to a friend of mine and she thought for a moment and said dryads, which I know we're a very Greek mythology loving group here at Tales of the Cocktail every year, but uh, that is literally spirits of the trees in uh, Greek mythology. So um, one other possibility, you know, we've got whiskey when we talk about things that are made from grains and brandy when we talk about things that are made from fruits. Why not dryads for things that are made from tree sap? Just a thought. <laughs> yeah. You know, what you and I and Brian thinks does not matter. The TTB, what they think is what matters. <laughs> <laughs> they, class, they, would, they would classify, classify <laughs> this as a speciality spirit. And that's what it is. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Maple wine is a thing. 
Mine is made from grapes. There needs to be something with four dryads. Mm -hmm. right? You ferment grain, you make beer. You ferment fruit, mm. you make wine. You ferment, ferment tree sap. Mm. And then you distill it, you make dryad. This is a good point. And I, I assume that there are terms, uh, that it, like non-English terms, for, the, for what we've been calling palm wine in Nigeria and in Sri Lanka that would be available for this. What? Yeah, in, in Sri Lanka it's called tari, T-O-D-D-Y. Tari, okay. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, we have many words. We have 350 languages in Nigeria. So even choosing the word Oguguru was extremely contentious. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we chose Ogogro actually because um, it's the word that no matter where you go, everyone knows what it is, whereas some words can be extremely niche. And you're absolutely right. This is why we're claiming the word and we're really anti-gin. Not I love drinking it, but I mean in terms mm. of the terminology, just because actually they describe these processes a little bit in more detail than uh, borrowing words from the West do. I agree. Um, awesome. So we've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, I will continue taking questions until they kick us out, but I will say I'm going to stick around. I think the panelists will all stick around for a bit if you want to ask one-on-one -on -one questions afterwards. But in the meantime, I see hands. I see hesitant hands back. Yes, all the way in the back. Great question. <clears throat> the the, um, the the sap of the coconut flower is high fructose, uh, but the TTB is not interested in the raw material as such. They are they have a, a categorized list, and if you don't fall into that category, you're out. Is either in or no. That's all. So, and then to drum the information into their heads takes, took me three, three, little over three years. So that's, uh, that's all I can say for now. Um, I'm going to try to get contact information up on the screen, but I saw uh, one more question over there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. If, if, the, if you want to drink it, I will provide it. If the whole of America wants to drink it, I can have it. <laughs> we can f produce about 5 million liters a month. Awesome. Yes, sir. Part two. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, actually, um, for us, uh, we really are... Uh, I, I think it's the product category that we need to go mainstream but we are positioning ourselves as really, you know, I spoke about the rules earlier and really making sure that we maintain a premium product with our small batch process. So while we do and we will um, look to expand further afield, we have actually been spending most of our time building out capacity for this reason. You do speak about America and we are in America, but Nigeria is 200 million as well. Mm -hmm. And Africa, as I said, is the second biggest continent in the world after Asia. So even locally, or what we might call domestically, uh, we have to think about these issues, let alone 
uh, from an American or a Western con context. So yes, as well, in a very different way to this gentleman. Yeah, yeah for us as well, capacity production is not a problem. Uh, Maple production is uh, maple syrup produ production is already uh, a big thing, and uh, we can adapt to 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 the demand. That's not a problem. And um, regarding your your first uh, uh, question, can you repeat it, that question again, please? Yeah. So as far as your specific ingredients uh, to your individual distilleries, has there been anything you've seen someone using it in, or with maybe even just a single ingredient mix, or things that you feel like wouldn't have worked? Uh, well, for acerum, uh, ginger, sesame, and and, and, and uh, cool. yeah, yeah, and, and other uh, type of uh, botanicals that I will not think of. That, that these are great matches. So sometimes you just need to explore, really. Uh, yeah. If I may, I think there's that's yeah. there's a great opportunity to piggyback off of that with one other quick Can question. I ask him a question. Oh, sorry, sure. were you talking about cocktails? Oh, fair, fair. Like, every time we take, actually, there's a fantastic bartender here, Mark, from uh, Baltimore. Uh, every time we take the drink somewhere unexpected, we always get an unexpected set of combinations because, obviously, we've been drinking it very simply in Nigeria, neat, on the rocks, mixed with palm wine or whatever. And, actually, we, people are just discovering it for the first time. So I did present to you the kind of people's choice in Nigeria, which is Zoboguru, Zobo and Oguguru. However, when you go to places like London, people make martinis from it and they really want to play with the subtleties and the complexity of the flavor inherent in the drink. Whereas when we're this side, we get spins on uh, daiquiris and rum kind of twists and things like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to have a chat with you afterwards as to what you thought about it as well and what you might pair it with. Thank you. uh, you've, you've answered a little bit the question I was about to ask, but I will throw it out there anyway. Uh, one of the advantages in the market that you know gin and whiskey, uh, for example, have is they have these big long lists of relatively canonical cocktail recipes that go with them that have been developed over the last you know couple of centuries. Um, and we don't necessarily have a, a canon of cocktail recipes that use these spirits in the same way, but we are at Tales of the Cocktail. Um, and uh, this is a good opportunity, I think. If there are people right now who are doing interesting things with your products or with your categories who are making today what we may in the future look back on as the canonical cocktail recipes for your spirits, like, let us know. Who are they? Where are they? How, how, where can we go and get those things? Any bartenders out there wish to talk to me? Please, you're welcome soon after. <laughs> And we heard, we heard about Mark from Baltimore. What's the name of your place? The Alt Room. The Alt Room. Great. I used to live in Baltimore. Whereabouts? Uh, we're in Fort Bruce. Okay. Phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Joel? Well, there, there are some places in, uh, in Quebec, uh, uh, in Quebec City and Montreal City that, that it's, uh, are exploring with, uh, with Acerum. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm not a cocktail person myself. I, I enjoy drinking them, but uh, I'm not a, uh, so I, I will let the, the people in the bar industry uh, explore uh, with that film. Fair enough. Um, I think we are now officially over our time. Is that? Five. We've got five minutes. As you We're fine to continue? Nigeria. <laughs> yeah. We have a Nigerian there, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, um, Devin, Devin has got to run, but the, the three of us will, will stay up here and continue taking questions until we're told otherwise. <laughs> for me? Okay. So since you are the moderator for this panel, is there, I'm assuming you are familiar with Shell in some capacity? I've been once or twice. Mm -hmm. make it more public, would there be an effort on the part of Tales to even give more um, spotlight, you know, to Asura?
Asarum, Ogogoro, and uh, Arak, for example? Uh, I would say I certainly hope so. Uh, so as I said at the beginning of this, I am just some guy. Um, <laughs> as far as any of this is concerned, uh, you know, the, this is what happens at Tails is a function basically of two things. It's of uh, what gets proposed and what, to, what gets selected. And I think that there is a lot of interest from the Tails organizers in selecting things like you've described. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, the, the people who we would want to have on those panels knowing that that opportunity is available to them and coming and, and proposing those types of things and, and being part of those, you know, seminar submissions. Now, I, I think. My hope for this is we've had, you know, our introduction to, I'm, I'm going to use the word dryads, um, as a whole today, um, and maybe in future years we have, you know, narrower deep dives into particular spirit categories within that broad classification, um, which is exactly the type of thing that Tails is for, is introducing people to stuff that they're not necessarily familiar with and going into sometimes truly absurd levels of detail on it. You know, this is our, this is our introductory class, and I think we can go a lot deeper, and, and I hope that you all have had a wonderful time here today, and that if you share that with anybody who was involved with Tales in any way, it might, you know, encourage them to, to seek out things like this in the future as well. I have no doubt. So much. Like, you can speak just an hour just on the design of the bottle right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, let alone, you know, how you tap the tree and the cultural significance around that. I, uh, I would actually like to, well, uh, Devin's not here, but we can repeat this when he gets back. I, I do want to uh, give a round of applause to all of our panelists for, among other things, having condensed a lot of information into about <laughs> 10 minutes each. <laughs> like, holy crap, guys. <laughs> oh, and Devin's back. Great, yeah. Repeat yeah. the round of applause. <laughs> we are just applauding the panel for having condensed a lot of information into a fairly short period of time. May, may, may I just say one thing before we close? I am uh, probably one of the oldest guys in this room today. <laughs> and, and the reason for my good health is Arak. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would also like to uh, inform or remind everybody that tomorrow is Thursday. Uh, that's not what I'm reminding you of. I think I was double checking that as I said it out loud. Um, tomorrow is Thursday, and tomorrow night uh, we are having a happy hour at Bartonique from 1 to 3 a.m. It is the last call happy hour of the night. Uh, it is the tree hugger happy hour. We will be having uh, cocktails and straight spirit, spor straight spirit pours of both Asarum and Arak. Um, Ogogoro is technically not available for sale in the United States yet. So these are all, they're perfectly legal sample bottles, but you know, not quite the <laughs> same. You guys are, are really at the bleeding edge of uh, experiencing these spirits of the trees. Um, uh, other, any other questions from the audience? I see one more. I have a question partially formed, so work with me on figuring out how to do it. <laughs> 